All right, welcome everybody to this week's edition of PhotoTube. Uh, we're very happy to see um, uh, Derek Tini here, and he's agreed to tell us um, everything he knows about soft pions, hydrodynamics, and the chiral critical point. Take it away. Okay, thank you. And I want to thank you for running this seminar series. I was just looking at it. There's a lot of great talks recorded, which I'm gonna have to listen to uh, in the future, okay? Um, so, um, all right, so this is based on these three papers. Um, the Latin, the primary, primary focus would be on this last paper, um, which just appeared in November. Okay, and those are my collaborators, Adrian, Eduardo, and Alex. Okay, um, so, okay, so just uh, my primary focus, which is probably different from you folks, uh, is actually on, uh, you know, colliding nuclei at, at very high energies at the, the LHC, right? And so, uh, okay, so here's a beautiful event display of Elise, you know, we collide two nuclei head on, okay? Um, we make this spray of particles, that's the quark on plasma, okay? And um, the big news is that, you know, it has hydrodynamic behavior, okay? And, and these days, the detectors are so good and the hydro is so good that you don't need any theory to see it or any analysis to see it, you can just plot the raw event display. Um, and this shows the energy flow in the CMS collaborate calorimeter. Okay, so this is, you know, the energy in the calorimeter. And, you know, if you have an event where, which collides off center with the impact parameter being in this direction. Okay, so this is this, the two nuclei, and this is the hot region, which has this elliptic shape, okay. Then it will expand preferentially along the short axis of the ellipse, okay? And that shows up in the detector as an energy distor distortion of the outflow, the flowing energy. And this is a plot of the energy flowing around the detector, okay? So you can very clearly see by eye, you know, the elliptic flow in this event, okay? Um, okay, and we call that V2, right? Um, elliptic for elliptic flow. Okay, there's also other events and there's lots of fluctuations in here. And so you can measure all kinds of harmonics, not just the second. So here's, a, here's an event, oops. Um, so you see here a triangular shaped event. So this is an event with this sort of triangular shape, okay, in the initial state. And because of that, you see some flowing outwards, hydrodynamic flow outwards, which shows up in the detector as energy flow um, in the calorimeter, okay. Um, so this is just one event, okay? Those are one events. Each of those events was just one events. Of course, they record billions of events, okay? And when the long and short of it is, if you can see something by eye with one event, then imagine what you can do statistically with, with billions, okay? Um, it's just incredible. And hydro works amazingly well, okay? So it's amazing hydro. It's the standard has become this hydrodynamics has become sort of the standard model of heavy ion physics. Um, it's, it's absurd. Um, for those of you who haven't been following it, I mean, you know, it's just amazing. Okay, so not only do they measure all these harmonics and their angles, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, they also measure the momentum dispendence, they measure the probabilities of VNs, right? You know, how much we, the, the probability of of finding a, a, an event with a given VN. You can measure the covariances between the harmonics, so V2, V3, V5, how are they correlated? In addition, they measure the full covariance matrix between V2 of P1 and V2 of P2. And so all of that sort of basically works with hydrodynamics. You can find some places where it sort of doesn't work, but you know, it's sort of incredibly successful and, and incredible amounts of phenomenology. Um, Okay, so what's left for us to do, right? Um, well, what's left out of this uh, standard model, hydro model, is of course any mention of chiral symmetry and chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, so the phase diagram of QCD, right, um, is characterized by a quark gluon plasma, right, um, with chiral symmetry restoration and at high temperature. Okay. And then at low temperature, it's uh, chiral symmetry is broken, okay? And there's a crossover temperature somewhere around uh, 
160 MeV, where the, the, the transition, we go from being chirally restored um, to chirally broken. Okay, now here's some hopefully familiar history. So for exactly two massless flavors, the symmetry group of QCD, um, the flavor symmetry group of QCD would be SU2 left cross SU2 right, which is um, homomorphic uh, to Z to O4. Okay, and this uh, symmetry is broken, okay, during the phase, phase transition for two massless flavors. And the transition from this symmetry restored to symmetry broken is a second order phase transition, at least for two massless flavors, okay? Now, uh, if you have a finite mass, which we do in nature, then you don't have an exact phase transition, but a crossover transition, and you get a sort of smooth crossover, um, which describes you know, this transition region, okay? Now, um, so nevertheless, you might hope that this O4 phase transition, um, you're kind of close to it, could provide some guidance you know, as to how to improve the hydrodynamic model um, and do even better and interesting things to look for, okay? Um, and currently, basically, this whole pattern of chiral symmetry breaking plays essentially no role in the standard hydro model um, at all, right? sort of afterthought. Okay, so this talk somehow improving that or trying to improve that, improve that situation, it's not so crazy because you know, the mass is an explicit breaking term. If the mass is pretty large, then you know, chiral symmetry is unimportant. Okay? I'm, but I'm gonna be taking the, the view that the mass is pretty small and I'm gonna be asking about the effects of chiral symmetry and its breaking um, on the fluid. Okay. Um, so, all right. So here's just my um, cartoon picture of uh, what is chiral symmetry breaking? What are pions? Okay. Uh, so uh, I, you know, give this talk. Uh, hopefully, it's not too basic. Okay. So um, our cold world, or T much less than the critical temperature, and the ground state is ordered. Okay. This uh, Q bar Q is uh, like the magnetization in the magnet, magnet. okay? It's a, it's a matrix, the order parameter is a matrix, right? So this Q can be either U or D. So this is a, a two by two matrix, okay? Um, the order parameter. And it's, it has a you know, non-zero expectation value in the vacuum, which is proportional to the density matrix. So U bar U plus D bar D um, is the trace, okay? Um, and, so now what is a pion? Well, if the vacuum has a slow modulation, um, this order parameter has a slow modulation in, phrase, in, in space, then this SU2 matrix, which describes the rotation of the, of the, of the condensate is the pion, right? And so this wave, wave, wave field, okay, this is the pion wave function, so to say. Okay. Now, of course, once you get above TC, then of course the, the ground state is not ordered at all. Okay, it's completely disordered. Okay, um, the chiral condensate has no particular value, no direction. Okay, even its, its magnitude is fluctuating. And then there are no pions to speak of. Okay, um, so what we're doing is sort of going from here to there, right? And uh, in a heavy ion collision. And you might want to know what happens as you go from there, from here to there, and what is the effect of this on, hydro on these. Um, Pion modes and how that couples with the rest of the fluid. Okay, so that will be the goal of this talk: somehow describe um, pion propagation during the O4 phase transition. How we go from there to there, what the pion propagation looks like, um, and so forth. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, good. So of course, you know, this O4 transition, you have an explicit mass term, and so you could ask how important is the mass? Well, it's quite important, right? And is there any evidence for this O4 phase transition in the lattice, okay, lattice QCD? So let's go now to the real world. This is the cartoon, this is the real world, okay? So this is real, a real world. Um, these are some, which provide some lattice evidence for the O4 critical point and its relevance to the real world, okay? So what is being plotted here is the fluctuations of the VEV, okay? So, you know, if you're really, the VEV is completely broken, okay? 
um, you know, as you get higher and higher temperature, this sigma begins to fluctuate strongly, okay? And so a natural thing to look at is the fluctuations in the order parameter as a measure of um, how important is the, uh, how close you are to the O4 critical point. So the fluctuations of the order parameter. Um, so what is plotted here are this susceptibility of the order parameter as a function of temperature. So there's a, a very narrow range. Okay, so it's really only 10 MeV right here, 20 MeV, okay? Um, and as a function of quark mass, right? So what's happening here is in these curves, these curves here, the quark mass is large, okay? And then the susceptibility only increases by say a factor of two or so, okay? And now as the quark mass gets smaller and smaller, they can do this on the lattice, right? Um, then uh, the susceptibility increases and you get uh, closer and closer um, to the critical point, okay? And the, the behavior of this curve, right? These um, sort of self-similar curves with the quark mass has um, scaling predictions from the O4 scaling theory. So uh, in principle, there is a, uh, a, you know, the dependence on this, of the susceptibility on the quark mass and on the temperature is a prescribed function, universal function, um, which should describe this behavior um, as you go up here. And qualitatively, it, it does. It seems to be working, okay? Um, so, so somehow, definitely the lattice, we should say the real world is sitting here on these green points. Um, so, um, so definitely now the, the lattice, QCD lattice seems to know about the O4 critical point. It realizes that we are so, somehow in the vicinity of a chiral critical point, otherwise we wouldn't describe this behavior, okay? And somehow hydrodynamics, right, should also, you know, we should build in this O4 symmetry into the hydro model. Okay, so that's what, hopefully some motivation, okay? Um, maybe I take some questions, just one second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, just as a, what is the qualitative argument that it's O4? I mean, so you have SU2 left, mm -hmm. SU2 right, and that's equivalent to O4. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Right, so it's SU2 right, that's right. Um, so you could have just written SU2 left, SU2 right. Um, uh, sorry. Please. Uh, in the face diagram you showed, uh, there was also a critical point. Is it expected to have the same universality class as this or not? No. Okay. No, it should be Z2. Right. Okay. No. So that would be in the, in, okay, it gets a little too much, but no, the answer is no. <laughs> um, it would be Z2, but, but they're connected. It, it's, it's very close to, there's a tri critical point which connects these two critical behaviors. Um, in the massless limit. Um, so I don't want to go into the details, but. Okay, thank you. But, but, but no, All right. So eventually this O4 critical point ends. Yeah, okay, let's stop there. Um, all right, so, um, okay. So let's start writing down hydrodynamics of uh, broken chiral symmetry, okay? Um, so, you know, if we look at the the conserved or the, the symmetries of QCD or approximately approximate symmetries of QCD, then you know you have some conserved charges. Okay, um, so you have the stress tensor. Of course, it's ac exactly conserved, baryon number almost exactly, yeah, basically exactly. Isovector charge essentially almost exactly for the perspective of heavy ion collisions. And finally, you have this isoaxial vector charge, which is only approximately conserved. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the indices here, right? So, whoops. Um, so the indices are um, the, uh, so the vector sign denotes the isospin index, okay? And uh, so you see that this has isospin index. Tau is the isospin poly matrices, okay? And the vector signs, you know, denote one, two, three for isospin one, two, three, okay? Um, all right, so hopefully that notation is clear. Um, those are the conserved currents, okay? I will basically drop the vectors whenever I can 
So you should realize that there's always a vector sign indicating isospin one, two, three. Okay, and then there's the, the chiral condensate uh, and its phase, um, which should be part of the hydrodynamic description. Okay, um, so just so very yeah. So, um, so the chiral condensate, um, we already talked about sigma and the phase of, of the chiral condensate, um, which is the pion field phi, right? And so when the symmetry is broken, the pion field, right, um, it, you know, is another variable that should be incorporated into the constitutive relations when you uh, write down hydro, okay? And finally, um, you know, if the since the symmetry is only approximate, we would add a, a mass term to the Goldstone field, so that they sort of decay at large distances. And then, effectively, you're writing down a theory of SU two left cross SU two right superfluid hydro, um, which was first written down somehow for ideal hydrodynamics by Son in 1999, which has very few citations. Um, um, so, um, and actually that was my interest. I knew this paper from Song and uh, wasn't concerned about the data at all, actually. And uh, just was wanting to know what someone wrote back in those years. And that's how I got started doing this. All right. Um, so, uh, okay. So the basic picture I have here, a fiction cartoon of what, oh, okay. And the last point, so, you know, below TC, um, this sigma is, uh, are essentially frozen and its value is essentially constant, just the phase that's rotating. And as you approach TC, the value of the VEV, you know, starts to fluctuate strongly, okay, becomes light. And then you need to incorporate the, the sigma field into the dynamics as well of, of the hydrodynamic description. And we'll do that in a little bit, okay? So, um, so here's the basic picture, right? So you have, um, we're, we're writing on hydrodynamic theory. We're working in a regime where uh, okay, the, hydro, the longest wavelength modes are just ordinary hydrodynamics because there's a finite mass term, okay? Um, for modes of order, m pi, okay? You get these pion modes or superfluid-like modes which contribute to the hydrodynamic description. And then finally, at, at the order of the cutoff, right? You get really the microscopic degrees of freedom which are, you know, the hadron gas, um, including, including, including hard pines, pines with momentum um, much, much, you know, water the temperature. Okay, um, so that's the basic picture below TC, right? And now, as you go up and you approach TC, right? Um, then you you have to include the sigma as well. Okay, so I kind of drew my cartoon here. So near TC, um, you have the same picture at very longest wavelengths. You have ordinary hydro. Okay. At somewhat shorter wavelengths and pi and m sigma, um, you have uh, the, these critical modes, okay? And uh, the shortest wavelengths, you still have the cutoff and, and all, of its, all of its stuff, okay? Um, great. So that's gonna be the picture for the hydrodynamic theory. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna start to develop. Okay, any, any questions on that? I have a question. Yes, please. So you're working in a regime where the pion mass is much less than TC, but aren't the pion mass and TC of similar order in the real world? Right, so yes, in principle, yes, they are. But if you actually, you know, temperature is not a good number, right? So really pi times the temperature is a good number, okay? Um, because the typical momentum is really pi T, not T, right? Um, you see it in holography, you see it in perturbation theory, you see it in the free gas, right? The typical momentum is really 3T. And so, you know, the pion mass is three times less than the temperature, and that's the regime where we're working, okay? Um, and that's my parameter. Now that doesn't sound too good, one third, right? Doesn't sound too good. But you should realize that the corrections that come to hydro actually come with the, the parameter, the mass squared, right? So if you look at a typical propagator, it's M squared compared to pi T squared. And, Indeed, then you're talking about a, a factor of 10% correction, which is really quite good. And, 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 and indeed, these pions that I'm going to be talking about are barely even measured in the heavy ion equation because they're so soft, right? They're sort of an afterthought for the, for the heavy ion experiment because they're, 
So no one bothers because they carry a negligible fraction of the head of the momentum. Right. So that's but that is the expansion that you know pi is less than it's greater than one somehow. Okay. okay thanks. Right. Okay. Um right. Um so but definitely the mass is not you know, we would be thrilled if the mass were half lighter than it is, okay? All right, so the mass is certainly an issue, All right? No. Okay, so good. Um, any other questions about this? Good question. I guess, I, I guess since you, I guess since you asked many, many years ago, um, including for me, uh, on the scale of my lifetime, a lot of people were looking for disoriented chiral condensates. Um, what is the relationship, if there is? It is. There is a relationship, except I would argue that they never looked properly, um, okay. never included the mass correctly, never even did a correct simulation. And in some sense, uh, this is a correct simulation I'm going to describe right? um, okay. as I go on. Right? So uh, it is essentially the same physics, but uh, the mass term is very important and it's never properly included. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so before we do hydro, so now we're gonna describe hydrodynamics below TC of the physics of the plants. Um, and so let's do when the symmetry is very strongly broken, then we're gonna write down the hydro theory below TC. Okay, so below TC, um, let's before we do hydro, let's do pressure, right? Equation of state. So the contribution of soft pions to the equation of state. Once you have the equation of state, you know, then essentially some technology um, tells you how to convert uh, equilibrium physics to hydro, right? Um, so first let's do hydro soft, um, you know, equation of state, okay? So the equation of state would look something like this. You're, you're writing down the partition function. Okay, so there are hard modes with momentum of order t. You integrate them out. You're left with a partition function which describes the soft modes, and you're trying to write down uh, an effective Lagrangian for this soft modes, this partition function. Okay, and uh, that is essentially dimensionally reduced because the, the momentum is it's a 3D partition function. The momentum is much much less than the temperature. Okay, um, so the appropriate effective Lagrangian is actually like three-dimensional, which describes the partition function of soft ions, is sort of three-dimensional uh, chiral perturbation theory. And so you would write down essentially the chiral Lagrangian, okay? With some parameters, um, F squared is the uh, sort of decay constant, spatial decay constant, and F squared, M squared. M squared is like the uh, screening mass of the pion, okay? Um, and both of those, those two parameters of this effective theory um, are, are, you know, functions of temperature, okay? Um, so for small angular fluctuations, you know, if phi is, is almost zero, then you just have like a simple scalar field theory um, for, three, for the three plans where these parameters depend on T, right? And furthermore, those parameters depend on temperature they decrease near the critical point or for critical points, okay, um, in a known way, okay. So the these uh, this f squared m squared, for example, right, um, is proportional to m q times psi bar psi, and that decreases like t to the power beta, where t is the reduced temperature. And so we actually have a lot of knowledge about how the pi and EFT um, should should behave near the critical point. Now, now you can't get too close to the critical point. Because if you get too close to the critical point, then you, you can't just limit yourself to pions. You have pions and sigmas, and uh, the, the AFT will be uh, based on that. Okay. Um, so once you have the pressure, then you can sort of like take this effective Lagrangian, right, and sort of use some technology from um, uh, basically holography to write down equation of motion. I mean, there's lots of ways you could do it, right? Um, and for instance, I just followed um, the, this, these authors, Jensen and, and Son and this Bhattacharya and these guys, okay? So if, if you, you would write the, the pressure in the presence of this 
temperature and phase and also chemical potential, okay? And, and it, it, it takes this form, okay? This is the effective Lagrangian we were talking about. This is coming from those hard modes, okay? Um, and then you would, you know, treat this pressure as kind of effective action, right? And derive basically by varying the effective action uh, with respect to the metric, you can find the, the, the conserved stress tensor of the fluid um, where you get, you know, basically a piece um, that looks like a dehydro, except you're using this full thing, okay? And then you get a superfluid, your superfluid strains coming from this contribution, okay? And varying with respect to some like gauge field that you could insert, you get sort of a current, um, the axial current, and then you get some normal vective piece, and then you get the so-called um, superfluid current, which is the derivative of the time field. Okay, um, so uh, so those you know would be very similar to a U one superfluid, right? Um, and that's because we've linearized the problem. In our paper, we didn't linearize the problem. Then you could write down a you know the SU two left plus SU two right superfluid. I'm not going to describe it here, right? So it's it's just more technicalities in some sense, okay? Um, because in fact the mass is very large, and so linearizing the problem is pretty good. Right? Um, so finally, the other condition you need when writing down hydrodynamics is you need to relate the the chemical potential to the time derivative of the phase, right? So that's known as the Josephson constraint, okay? That somehow the time derivative of the phase is the chemical potential. It's kind of very plausible, right? Because the Poisson, you know. Poisson bracket of, of number and chemical potential. Well, that's very closely related to the Poisson bracket of number and phase. And so that's where it comes from, okay? Um, so more formally, you could require that this, that, you know, this is the BEV, right? It's charged under the, under this, um, under the charge. So, you know, it's gotta be stable, which means that the Poisson, you know, the commutator of the BEV with H minus mu A should be zero. And you can start to see it. I'm not going to derive it here, but you start to see the relationship. You know, this commutator gives you this derivative, okay? And this commutator gives you the mu, and, and that's how this Josephson constraint comes out, okay? Um, so, okay, so now we have ideal hydro, right? Um, it consists of the conservation of stress, charge, and the Josephson constraint. And now we work out corrections to this ideal hydro, um, which you know were worked out somehow by Son and Stefanov um, back in O2, right? And then there's a tiny bit from us, which I'll describe. Okay. Um, um, okay. Question. Yes, please. Um, hi, Derek. This is Pavel Kovtun. Um, uh, how do you think about uh, mu a experimentally? Mu a. I think of it as time derivative of pi n, basically, right? Well, not true. I mean, mu a is mu a above TC. Mu a is very well defined. It's essentially essentially conserved. I mean, the time scale of heavy ion collision, you know, the the quark mass above TC, the quark mass is really negligible, and mu a is conserved. I mean, charge is conserved. Right? The axial charge is conserved. It, it's anomalous, right? No. It's not U1, it's oh, isovector. It's, uh, oh, it's that one, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. so it's a perfectly conserved concurrent, mm -hmm. which is non anomalous mm -hmm. and uh, at least above TC, you know, it's, uh, it's, very, it's exactly conserved. Now, below TC, right, then it, it has not exactly conserved, um, but it has a correction that's due to the quark mass, right, um, which uh, is the non, the partial conservation of axial current, isovector axial current. Okay. Sorry, uh, I, I was under the same impression. Like, why is it not anomalous? Like, which current is this? This is isovector axial charge. So I go back here. So, yeah. So, I mean, you have stress, baryon number, isovector charge, and isovector axial charge, meaning that there's an isospin index. So it's u right minus d left. Right, and you, oh. right? and that makes it non-anomalous, right? right? So you write 
u right minus u left, that's anomalous, right? But u right minus d left is not anomalous. Right? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but still, still, I have, I have, I have a mental puzzle in my mind. Like, how do I actually go ahead and prepare a thermal equilibrium state with no uh, problem non-zero non value of mu a? No problem. I mean, you have left and right. Um, in mm -hmm. the initial conditions, there will be fluctuations, right? That will give you local de local densities, just like strange and, and isospin. Right? There's no net ice, no net strangeness. Nevertheless, strangeness is conserved. There are local fluctuations in it, and they propagate, right? And the same thing here. You'll have difference between left and right-handed quarks, okay, locally, okay, mm -hmm. and they will propagate, right? And um, since they're conserved. They will be basically live from the begin initial conditions all the way to the end. Right? Mm, so we but, do it all the time. It's strange. But, but right, 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 right. So, so they, but at low temperature, it's not conserved, right? At low temperature, it is still conserved, right? Um, the correction will be linear in the quark mass. So at high temperature, the correction is quadratic in the quark mass, which is mm -hmm. truly negligible. Mm -hmm. And it, at a low temperature, it's linear in quark mass. It's non-conserved. It's, it's linear in the quark mass. But the way it's not conserved is to tie it with this pi and field. Mm -hmm. So effectively, you know, it's a different dynamics. But essentially, you know, you have ideal hydro, which is correct at order mq, and then you have viscous corrections, which are then um, higher, higher, higher order, right? And so you can still write down some ideal dynamics. Um, which uh, is uh, essentially, you know, almost good as being conserved, right? Um, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So somehow that's what they really said. Okay. And I thought about it myself, but you know, these guys said it probably. Okay. Back in mm -hmm. the right. And so, uh, so um, you know, in many ways, many things were known before them. I don't want to say, it, but. Uh, Okay, so basically you would have this partial conservation of axial charge and things. So this would be a statement that this term is linear in the quark mass. Okay, and you get a correction here due to this phase. Then you get here the Josephson constraint, which says that lowest order, you know, you know, the Joseph, the time derivative of the phase is the chemical potential. Okay, and now you would start to expand both this J. Right, and the phase in terms of gradients, right? And they would start to have their own dynamics, okay? Um, so the form of the gradient expansion would be first, then you have a correct, the ideal current that's we already described, right? Um, and then you have corrections. Um, for instance, here you could add gradient of chemical potential, right? The normal conductivity. Um, and and the Josephson constraint, you would also add correction. So you would say, okay, the phase is ideal hydro is 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 locked to the chemical potential at lowest order, but at higher order, it can have its you know the phase of this one pi and field is not determined by the, the chemical potential of all the other charges, but um, you know is, has some corrections, right? So, so it will deviate from the chemical potential by these corrections. You know, there's different terms you could write down. For instance, you know, the gradient of phi is allowed. Um, or, you know, since it's not conserved, you can just write the phi itself, okay? But, you know, the reason why it's not conserved is because of a small parameter, um, the m squared. And so this gradient squared and the m squared are, are considered to be the same order of magnitude um, in, the, in this power counting, okay? Um, so then essentially you have, you know, high, viscous hydro, which has three coefficients, lambda zero, kappa two, kappa one, and you can start to analyze it, okay? And so what we did was we sort of realized, we started to look at the two-point function and ask whether they equilibrate. Um, and we found that it didn't equilibrate, basically, we were doing, you know, hydrokinetics. We basically found, you know, that this didn't equilibrate unless kappa two was equal to kappa one. And then we started thinking, we started demanding positive entropy production, okay? And then we eventually realized that you need kappa two to be kappa one, okay? Um, and if you look in Landa-Lifshitz, 
what Lana Leavesheets tell you, say, of course, you're supposed to expand the, the strains in terms of their conjugate momenta, right? In order to get positive entry breathing reduction. And so we basically found that two of those coefficients in the gradient expansion are constrained by this positive entropy production constraint, namely that we should um, expand the strain in, in this conjugate momenta, um, which is the derivative of the action, our effective action with respect to this phi, which is sitting right here. Okay, so somehow um, we should have realized that. Uh, maybe Son and Stefanov should have realized that. Um, but it took us a while and we eventually said it, okay? Uh, you should expand the strains um, in terms of the conjugate momentum and that fixes some of the coefficients, okay? Since then, okay, um, there's been a lot of holography, which I haven't really been following, I must say. So um, I, I try, I'm not doing justice, but I at least mention that there's work being done. I don't wanna, you know, say it all. Okay, I know somehow the organizers we're talking about um, spontaneously broken symmetries and, and explicit breaking. There's some papers here. This relation was realized in holography by these papers. Um, you know, and more real, more more closely, um, you know, more recently, uh, there was somehow an analysis of this explicit symmetry breakings um, in these papers. And, and I'm sure I've missed, I missed. I mean, there were I was trying to look in before the talk, but I I, I missed. Okay, so if I don't, you don't see your name, I'm sorry. Maybe um, you missed Carl because he has his Carl, hand. Carl, I, I cite, first of all, I'm hiring his student, so that should count for something. <laughs> 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 Maybe Carl is just a question. And, and second Carl. of all, uh, you know, I, I think he is on one of these papers, maybe. But I, no, no, I actually am not. But this, is, this is why I have a question, I guess. And, um, so, uh, so if I understood correctly, there is only one coefficient which you call here this lambda m, right? Right. And so, how can I understand this in the massless limit? Uh, because in the massless limit, I would have thought that I can still add derivative corrections to the Josephson constraint. Yeah. Right. You have this term, right? Right. But oh, so lambda m doesn't. Okay. 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 Then M multiplies the mass term and the derivative. Right. Oh, sorry, because I thought because it's called lambda M, it's sort of. Yeah, uh, maybe a bad name in that sense. Sorry. It sense <laughs> but it multiplies the M. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. Fair, yeah, yeah. I bad name. I maybe call it something and, else. Okay, but the other question I always have at this point is, um, couldn't you go, you know, Pavel always emphasizes this, that you have these choices of, um, um, choosing some sort of frame or a, a definition out of equilibrium by what well, what you mean by a chemical potential. Yes. Right? So I, I would have thought that um, at least for the massless case, you could choose a definition of chemical potential mu A such that the Josephson uh, constraint is actually exact to all orders in the derivative. Yes, in the derivative. I think that's allowed, right? So can, can you still do this when you have this mass correction? Or is this so I've made a frame choice. You guys are good. I've made a frame choice. I made a frame choice and you know it could be formalized so so I encourage someone to do it um, but we made a frame choice we didn't add any corrections to the right hand side of the PCAC relation so you see I put here at all orders I assume that the the conservation partial conservation of current takes exactly this form and if you had chosen the this um, derivative corrections to no derivative corrections to mu then you would have had to put the derivative corrections here on the right-hand side of the PCAC, right? Okay. And so okay. that's where that would have come in. And so I've chosen a specific frame where there's no correction to PCAC, right? Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, clarify, so thank you. Right. Um, so again, I, I would love to see that formalized, and, you know, and I think it would be good to do, right? Um, Okay, so finally, I, I just mentioned here, there are noise terms, okay? The uh, noise terms here, you have to add, of course, once you add, have them, you have some noise terms, which, uh, which, oh, sorry, which, uh, which are required to the system which is equilibrium. Okay, so now just a few comments here um, about, uh, so good, I think we had a good discussion about, so those are the hydrodynamic equations of this, Clients, right? At least below TC. Okay. 
And uh, it's nice discussion anyway, I like it. And so now we just look at the long wavelength modes, okay? And ask how the dispersion curve of these modes go like. Uh, and so you can um, basically linearize the equations of motion, okay? Um, and of course you have normal solution to the linearized equations of motion and you can find the dispersion curve. And the dispersion curve of this plans has, um, you know, this, this neat form of the gold stone. So it sort of has this um, plan velocity term, d squared, q squared plus m squared. And this plan velocity is uh, this ratio of these um, coefficients in my um, static action of, of ideal hydro. So I would argue that the pi and velocity has a very simple interpretation. So you see it's less than one, right? Um, so if you were to divide up the susceptibility into a, a superfluid susceptibility, oops, which is F squared and a normal susceptibility delta chi, right? Which is the fluctuations in the normal fluid. then the pi and velocity is essentially just the ratio between, um, you know, is, is this quantity, and you see it's just the relation, the ratio between the superfluid component divided by the superfluid plus normal components, right? And so from you know this perspective, right, as you go towards TC, like the superfluid component um, is 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 going to zero, right? And so the pi and whereas the normal component is becoming like all of it, okay? And so uh, so basically you expect the pi and velocity to go to zero near TC, and um, and it does so in a very specific way. Okay, um, okay. So, you know, if you have this pion superfluid, let's uh, look for what happens with soft pions um, in heavy ion collisions, right? Um, so, uh, if I look at, you know, you know, is there any evidence for problems with soft pions in in the heavy ion data? And the answer is. Yes, there is. Okay, so if you look at soft pions, right, there's by which are difficult to measure, right? So these are very small momentum beasts. Okay, the typical momentum is this black line, maybe, okay, and this carries a very small fraction of the energy. And if you take a hydro fit, they all essentially all have trouble fitting these soft pions. And they have tried, they've added zillions of resonances, and none of it helps. Okay, it doesn't bring them up to the data, and because you know it's constrained by other aspects of the uh, uh, of the collision, right? And so essentially, all hydroanalysis that I know of, even the most sophisticated, have trouble fitting these um, um, soft pions from the LHC. Okay, and so, and in particular, the yield is is enhanced. Okay. So you won't find broad agreement about the importance of those soft pions or the importance of the deviation. Um, for me, at least, um, you know, I'm taking it as a sign that we're not including chiral symmetry breaking properly. Okay. Um, so, okay. And Derek. Yes. But, so that would mean that there is like remnants of the critical point at LHC energies. Yes. We're chiral critical point. Chiral critical point. It's not the not the Z two critical point, but the chiral one, right? In fact, I would say right. So it's it's not not the Z two. It's the O four, right? So it really is the best place to look for it is at the LHC zero baryon density. Okay, and and then it's very very natural. I'm going to move this out of the way, okay? Because if you look at uh, the Bose Einstein factor, right? Um, you know. Basically, you know, at small momentum, you expand this, let's do massless plan. And the yield of the, the Bose Einstein factor is T divided by the dispersion curve, VQ. And, you know, that goes to infinity near TC since the pion velocity is going to zero, right? And so, and also the mass is going to zero near TC. So it's very natural from a perspective of chiral symmetry breaking to expect an enhancement of these very soft pions. Your TC. Um, and so, well, okay, so like I said, you won't find broad agreement. Um, we did make an estimate of it, okay, so, uh, and here's our estimates of it, okay. Um, so, let's see, yeah, let's see, on the slide. 
so you know if I modify the dispersion curve relative to vacuum, okay, um, then you know the yields of these pions increase, right? And then put here this modified dispersion curve, right? The dispersion curve comes from this hydrodynamic theory, like v squared goes to ten to zero, and so does m squared. M squared in, v squared m squared goes to zero near T C, okay? And so you could make an estimate for how much you expect um, the ion yield to be increased um, by the drop in the chiral condensate near the, near the, uh, near the critical temperature or pseudo critical temperature. Um, and indeed, you know, actually this, this M squared, these are static quantities. A lot of them are measured actually with pretty high precision. So M squared, for instance, is known very precisely from lattice data. V squared, not as well known, but still also good. I mean, at the level of phenomenology, I'm doing it amazingly great, like 20%, okay, <laughs> all right? And so assuming that the chiral condensate drops essentially by a factor of a half um, between, from its vacuum value is extremely reasonable and uh, it matches what they're seeing for this M squared. And then making that assumption, um, we, you know, we would, per, per, you know, make a, we estimate the ratio of critical yields from the critical dispersion curve relative to the vacuum dispersion curve. And so the, the ratio, just you know, this ratio of factors, right, um, would sort of start at, at 50% or so, or 40%, and increase as you increase momentum from just these formulas. Of course, eventually you get to high enough momentum that you don't expect hydro to be valid anymore. And then Basically, I would expect it to go over to its back to its vacuum, you know, stuff. So at some cutoff, you know, the hydro is no longer valid, and you sort of would expect to go back to um, hydro like normal vacuum physics here. Okay, and so we, you know, this would be my expectation for how this ratio would go for some critically enhanced dispersion curve. Okay, mm, question. I let me just finish this. So you know, and it, you know. It's a, at least a motivating, encouraging me to pursue it further. Okay, that's all I want to say. Yes, and then I'll take questions. Yeah. Um, right. So, what the detector counts is like actual pions, right? And what the model has is hydro. This is some collective classical field phi. Very right. good. So let me and, explain. So and the way you go between the two is through the first line on this slide, which me, makes me sort of very, very uneasy. Well, let me make you less uneasy. I took the hydro hydrokinetic theory. I don't have the slides here, okay? But it, it's actually completely rigorous. I took this effective hydrodynamic equations, okay, mm -hmm. which are stochastic hydrodynamic equations. Then, as you know, there is a hydrokinetic theory which matches hydrodynamics onto kinetics, right? Um, hydro, you know, me and Misha um, developed hydrokinetic theory. And the hydrokinetic theory is exactly a Boltzmann equation for the pions with the modified dispersion curve. And it exactly approaches an equilibrium limit, which is this one here with the modified dispersion curve. And so it's totally reasonable to match this hydro theory to this Boltzmann description which then at low temperatures goes on to the regular Boltzmann description. So I don't have the slides here, but in our paper, we did that, that matching explicitly and constructed the hydrodynamic theory for this, uh, hydro, the hydrokinetic theory for this theory, and it explicitly reproduces uh, the Boltzmann calculation. Right. Uh, right, right. I was wondering maybe if you could spend a minute or so commenting on this uh, aspect of the hydrokinetic theory, because naively it looks like you're taking like water waves and you're sticking them into some quantum distribution and you're saying that's how I'm counting particles. Classical, and, classical, uh, classical limit, classical limit. So you see, I take here just the classical part of this Bose-Einstein distribution. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right, right. And because um, the momentum is much smaller than the momentum. Mm -hmm. So it's classical. Mm -hmm. And so basically, we calculate the two point functions in the stochastic hydrodynamic theory mm -hmm. and ask how that um, those two point functions evolve mm -hmm. in this limit where the mass is, you know, small and, and but not like asymptotically small. 
Mm -hmm. and, there, and there you see that it matches to the hydrokinetic hydro effective theory. And you can work out the evolution of those two point functions in the hydrodynamic theory, and it's given by a Boltzmann equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, and so it's perfectly legit, legit, actually, just to take that mm -hmm. dispersion curve and plug it in there. The quantum part, though, okay, so is definitely not legit. Now, what you would love, what I would love to have, okay, beyond this leading term, what I'd love to have is the first semi classical correction, mm -hmm. right? And that's actually very important for phenomenology, right? Th this mm -hmm. T over VQ is good, right? But T over VQ plus a half works really, really well, okay? And mm -hmm. uh, so if you take this distribution and include those first semi-classical description, um, which we haven't worked out, you're getting an excellent, excellent description over, over all of this range, right? Okay, right. great. So, uh, so there's room to work out this first semi-classical description to the hydrokinetics would be lovely to have right, in this mm -hmm. particular case, right? Um, okay, thanks. Right. right, so, you know, take at least this part, I would claim you should, well, shouldn't really believe it because it's very rough, but, but plugging it into the classical part of the Bose-Einstein distribution is perfectly legit. Um, so, um, so, so it's, it's very encouraging. Um, you know, it motivates, of course, the system is expanding as you approach the critical point, you don't really have pions anymore, right? As we discussed, I mean, the VEV is fluctuating, right? And so using this pion effective theory, which is valid well below TC, right at TC at the boundary of applicability, that's cheating, okay, <laughs> right? That's really cheating, right? So, well, I mean, it's not so bad. I'm taking a theory, I'm working it right at the boundary of applicability, okay? Um, but anyway, so that encourages us to do more work, right? We write down a hydrodynamic theory, which can gracefully transition from diffusion of quarks, right? To propagation of plants, okay? And so that's uh, essentially the last part here. Um, talk, I don't know how much time I have left. So hydro at TC, right? Yeah, you had a lot of questions. So um, you, I would argue you have still have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, hydro at TC. Okay, well, we have to go quick, okay? So- um, Don't so, hurry, yeah, don't hurry. We have a hydrodynamic uh, of the O4 transition. The, the fields are the order parameter, which is a, an O4 uh, transforming into fundamental, okay? It's, it now involves the sigma and the pi. The, the approximately conserved charges are the isovector charge, this one, and the iso, oops, and the isoaxial vector charge, this one, which are combined into an, an O4 antisymmetric tensor, NAB, right? So there are six in total, which, you know, um, which form this, you know, O4 charges, uh, uh, you know, for a joint representation of, of O4 symmetry, right? Um, so great, and these NABs, they generate rotations, which means that classically, at least you would have this you know, non-trivial Poisson bracket between you know, these charges and these fields, um, which you have to use to sort of construct the hydrodynamic theory. Um, so the hydrodynamic theory has been written down a long, long time ago by Roger Gopal and Bill Chek um, in, in a very insightful paper, actually, um, where, Okay, so um, so okay, so basic structure would be that somehow the expectation would be that the hydrodynamic theory close to the critical point goes something like this. Um, you have a Hamiltonian, right, um, or free energy if you like, um, and that free the parameters of the free energy near the critical point can be taken like this, like lambda is arbitrary, m squared is is chosen so that you reach the critical point, and then you have this. Um, Multiplet of conserved charges and this order parameter field, um, which are working with each other, right? And the, the equilibrium distribution of the stochastic hydrodynamic fields is Z, right? Um, and it's e to the minus h. Okay. So then the hydrodynamic equations of motion, you know, take the form of like the ideal ones. Take this this simple sort of, you know, derivative of you know commutator Poisson bracket of phi with h and the Poisson bracket of n with h, 
um, determines like the convective parts of the ideal hydrodynamic equilibrium motion, right? Um, then you add like viscous corrections and, and noise in, in sort of the usual way, okay? So you know the Poisson brackets between the, the charges and the scalar field. And so you can work this out, right? Um, basically following the logic of operating homework. Okay, so, so basically, you know, if you add dissipation and noise, so here's you know, the ideal part, which is zero. And now if I add dissipation and noise, again, you expand the strains in terms of derivatives, in terms of conjugate variables, which are the derivatives of this um, Hamiltonian, right? Or free energy, right? Um, and so you get corrections to the, or the order parameter equation of motion. And you know you get dissipation here in the order of parameter equation motion, and so this relationship between these coefficients is now on steroids. I mean, so we had kappa one, and kappa two, right? Now you really have like kappa one, two, and three, and they're all equal because they all need to be this derivative of this three energy, okay? And so, uh, okay, so and this is exactly what is was done by Vilcek and Roger Gopal. Um, back in 1990, right? Um, okay, so essentially those are our equations of motion that we're gonna solve. Um, I'm gonna solve it uh, numerically, right? So here's a little more explicitly the equations of motion. You have this um, conservation of charge, which has some sort of ideal currents. This is like, um, you know, the Poisson bracket terms, then you have some diffusion and, and noise and you have explicit symmetry breaking here. And for the order parameter, you have very similar kind of equation, um, the sort of like, you know, Poisson brackets and dissipation and noise, okay? Um, so this would believe to, this sort of models, which have a long history, would are believed to capture the correct uh, real-time dynamics close to the critical point. Um, at high temperatures, as we'll see, I mean, as we'll see, high temperatures, it just approaches normal diffusion equation. And at low temperatures, it just approaches the pi and effective theory that we wrote down before. And in between, it sort of interpolates between those two limits. Okay, so this is some now some pretty serious numerics. Okay, I mean, you know, you won't do it on Mathematica, right? Um, uh, so then you sort of have 100,000 CPU hours. Um, to evolve the system. And so neatly, we, instead of solving the Langevin equations, we viewed this um, Langevin steps as Metropolis Hastings updates, which is um, very technical, but potentially a, a great saver or numerical way to solve um, uh, the Langevin equations. Okay, so, uh, so here's some some simulations. Okay, so here's some details. I don't want to you know, spend too much. So, you know, there's a lot of homework that needs to be done. Like, first, you need to tune this scalar field, the mass parameter the scalar field, to be right, right near the critical point. Then, of course, you don't want to do any harm, right? So, we're doing real time dynamics, but we should also reproduce the statics of the, of the O4 critical point, like the critical exponents, the correlation length, and so on. All of which have been measured in you know gory detail with very high precision, much higher precision than we have in our simulations previously. So the static VEV is supposed to take this scaling form, okay? And we did verify that it you get the right critical exponents with the, like one or two digits, two digits, and we um, reproduce the scaling curves for how the, the VEV should should behave as a function of te reduced temperature and reduced field. And the non-universal parameters we fit to our code, um, um, this m squared, this m frac squared, and this scale, this units for the magnetic field. Okay, and so then you know basically we're going to make a sequence of measurements across the phase transition. So this plots the susceptibility. So chi is the susceptibility as a function of this scaling variable z. Okay, so Z is like proportional to the temperature. Since the quark mass is finite, the susceptibility never diverges, diverges it reaches a, a maximum, right? Um, and that maximum happens when not at the critical point, but right when Z is about 1.3, okay? um, the so-called pseudo-critical point. 
So these, let's just talk about the results of these simulations at these five black points, okay? Um, and sort of see, see what happens, okay? So, all right, so here's what you see. We calculated on the axial charge, axial charge correlator as a function of temperature, right? Um, and so let's everyone take a second to get this definition, right? So this is what you see, right? Axial charge at time zero, axial charge at time t. We're integrating over all x, and it's really the k equals zero limit, okay? And so now let's, we march through TC. So if you're at the critical, pseudo critical point, you basically see just a diffusive behavior, okay? And as you lower TC, you start to see these oscillations in the correlation function, which reflect you know, the pi and pole, okay? So it's much easier, although it's the same information, it's much, much easier to analyze it in Fourier space. So we analyze it in Fourier space, okay? Um, so in Fourier space, you know, you're calculating this, this correlation function and, and the correlation function you see is essentially at high temperatures, you basically get ordinary diffusion equation. This is the you know, symmetric correlator, of the ordinary, basically ordinary diffusion equation. Now, as you load TC, lower TC, like the VEV begins to develop and the axial charge becomes increasingly more tied in with the pions through the through the Josephson constraint. And as, uh, as that happens, right, you start to get you know, prion propagating poles as you go from high temperature um, to low temperature, right? So, you know, arguably, you know, this is the only place where you can sort of <laughs> calculate the diffusion, you know, see the transition from the diffusion of quarks at high temperatures to basically, you know, prion propagation below, below the critical temperature, right? Um, so I'm going to skip the next slide, but I want to say that we, um, because it really is getting late here, right? But I want to say, like, we did calibrate this uh, pi and pole, and we did verify that it agrees you know, perfectly well with the pi and EFT. So at low temperatures, we very much match smoothly on um, the pi and EFT that we talked about earlier. Um, we looked at the pole position and and so forth, and, and exactly it matches with what you expect. And so, well, I, I was kind of skip it. It's very fast, but but um, this is basically that you know verifying that we looked at the gelman oaks renner relationship, um, and we see that below far enough below TC, we can fit the pole mass and verify the gelman oaks renner relationship between which predicts the pole mass and the VEV, the relationship between between the pole mass and the VEV. Okay, um, so, so that's good. So we, we're seeing my first goal, like we have a code that correctly captures the transition dynamics from diffusion of quarks um, to pi and propagation. The next thing we wanted to do was to look at how the relaxation time, like the dynamical critical exponent, like how the width depends on how close you are to the, to the critical point, okay? And so we looked at these correlations at, right at TC. So we, we looked at you know, simulation, the scaling of the simulations right at the critical point temperature. And of course, we have a finite magnetic field of quark mass. So we're not going right through the quark to the critical point. Okay. Um, and as you see, you know, these are these response functions as a function of the quark mass or the magnetic field. And so you know, this is the strongest magnetic field. Okay which has the broadest shape right? and, and so on, right? And so uh, now you uh, can look at how these, these curves, these response functions um, depend on the magnetic field. And, you know, they clearly has some sort of self-similar behavior, right? So this is, you know, you could imagine trying to rescale the axes, like basically the y-axis and the x-axis with the correlation length and see what you could, if you can find a universal curve, right? Um, so, so that's what we did, right? Um, so uh, you know, basically you expect that the omega times GAA should be a universal function of omega times typical relaxation time. And the typical relaxation time will grow with the correlation length to 
uh, a critical exponent, so-called dynamical critical exponent, zeta. And, um, okay, so, well, okay, so, you know, we basically fit this zeta by, you no. Know, so these are this dynamical response functions, and then sort of demanding that the peaks line up, okay, or finding the best, we know the correlation length, finding the, the best value of zeta such that, you know, these curves um, will collapse onto each other. And so, you know, taking zeta, you know, 1.47, which is our best fit, I'm, you can uh, basically see a good dynamical collapse. So it's, you get sort of uh, scaling of these response functions near the critical point. Okay, so um, maybe I take one last set of questions here because it was kind of fast and we were quite proud of these results. Um, so I, I uh, pause here for just one second. Right? Um, hi again. So just just so that I understand correct correctly. So so what you are saying is that you you're doing this not just near the critical point such that the wavelength is greater than the correlation length. You actually want to take this all the way like exactly at the critical point. Is this, is this right? I mean, we're basically the wavelength is of order that the wavelength of the pions and the sigma are much greater than the microscopic cutoff, mm -hmm. right? And that defines the correlation line, universal um, dynamics, right? So they are certainly, everything is of order the correlation lines, but the sigma is order. The, the, the static correlation length that has all like the, the, those critical exponents, right? Right. So like this is this, this is certain length scale, right? That's and a the, length scale. Right, so the validity regime of your theory uh, is uh, when the wavelengths of that effective hydro theory is greater than this correlation length, or yeah. can it become smaller than the correlation length? Actually of order, it can be, um, the hydrodynamic theory is basically then, you know, everything is is of order. They're all the same order. I mean, you're you're at the critical point, so the correlation length is m sigma, and the pion wavelength is also of order m sigma, right? Mm -hmm. And and the typical hydro mode is also m sigma, all of which is you know um, the typical momentum, all is also order m sigma, right? And so all of which is is you know still much longer than like the cutoff scale, right? the lattice space. Right, and uh, like the equation of state is is not an input here, right? It's not an not an input. No, uh, just the location. I mean, basically, it comes out right. So we we basically mm -hmm. simulate this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, when you do critical phenomena, you have basically a regular part of the pressure, a regular mm -hmm. part of the equation of state. And that is never, you know, that is some, that we don't, that you have to put in, right? And the, the, the uh, we don't need to put it in if you're only interested in critical behavior. And the irregular part or non-analytic part is coming out from this simulation. So you put in this Lagrangian, Right, you do the simulation and the sort of scaling of the equation of state mm -hmm. near the critical point is classical and determines this, this dynamics, right? Right, so the critical exp exponents are calculated here, they're not assumed. They're not, both, they're calculated. Both the static and the dynamic. Both the static and the dynamic, right. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and, and the fair, yeah, that's right. So there was a question from Alexander. I don't hear you, Alexander. You don't hear me. Okay. Now I hear you. Now, now, I hear you. you do? now we hear you. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is all very interesting, actually. Uh, and uh, some time ago, we were studying very similar process, uh, but uh, in relation to translation symmetry breaking. And uh, there, uh, we had a similar picture with one peak above critical temperature splits into two peaks below critical temperature. And uh, we, we were studying the quasi-normal modes and we saw that uh, there are actually two quasi-normal modes which take part in this process. Uh, 
so can you comment somehow on this like do do, do you have two quasi normal modes somewhere and uh, how the second quasi normal mode comes about i mean essentially we you can do a mean field analysis um and we did that and in in the mean field analysis you can really see like okay like as the web develops right you know above tc basically you have a scalar field which is uncoupled to the charge right and as the vev starts to develop these commutators which are sitting here maybe i can put it somewhere there right yeah here right so above tc you see this vev is not there and basically then you get it just uncoupled the, the scalar field being uncoupled from the charge and below tc it becomes active right but it becomes just a constant. This phi b is one of the indices, is just a constant. That's the web, right? And then you see that you get somehow a precession term between the, the scalar field and, and the web, right? Um, which then couples these two equations. And it's that coupling between the two equations um, which gives you this pi and propagation, right? Um, Right. So in that sense, I think you can do like a, a minimal mean field model and it, it doesn't do a bad job at describing our data. It doesn't get the right scaling X behavior. So this 1.5, I mean, this D over two, you don't get from mean field analysis, right? So this, the fact that the relaxation time scales with you know, fractional power, um, like in mean field theory would just be a constant. And um, this, the fact that this changes as you approach the critical point uh, is non-trivial, but still the qualitative features of behavior um, can be understood with the mean field system. Right. Okay, so I'm, I'm basically in my last slide. Um, so I just put up, I don't see any more corrections. So, so I, I put up my last slide here. So basically, you know, we are simulating the real-time dynamics of, of the chiral critical point, okay? Um, the, the numerical method I didn't touch on, but it could be used for stochastic, it's very similar to traditional lattice methods. And it could be used for stochastic hydro more generally. And for those heavy iron folk in this call, which I think there are only one, right? It has the potential to be extremely stable. And so, because it, it sort of cannot run away, it's based on you know, entropy being <laughs> increasing all the time. And so I'm excited about potentially using this um, metropolis hasting updates, updates for stochastic hydro which could probably simulate like very small systems, okay? Um, we did find the, the correct um, dynamical scaling laws, um, right? And uh, so, you know, we sort of see that it goes like C to the, you know, the correlation length to the power D over two, um, or we're getting 1.47. The theoretical prediction from Ilchek was D over two, um, or I guess it's, Hopper and Hollenberg, D over two. And you know, the pine waves are, are well calibrated in the sense that we're doing a static simulation. We see the correct pine properties of the pine of T. And now, you know, our next goal is to like really consider the expanding case where you start above uh, TC, right? You cool the system below TC, right? In this dynamical process. And then you can predict basically the these soft pions and their correlations that come out, right? Because what, what we know is that this soft pion hydro effective theory matches on to a Boltzmann equation. And so essentially you can find from such simulations the source for the Boltzmann equation. So you have to you know, source the Boltzmann equation and essentially such simulations um, can provide the correct source for the, the Boltzmann, for the, both that Boltzmann equation and ideally, uh, you know, then make some actual real predictions for experiment, okay? Um, so, and, so that gets me pretty excited. I mean, somehow the hadronization 
of, of plants, right, is probably the only heteronization process that can be studied with some degree near the 04 critical point, okay, is the only heteronization process that can be some, studied with some degree of rigor, okay, in the sense that there are some universal equations that are written down. And that's kind of cool that hydro is the thing that can do that, right? Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek, for this exciting and inspiring talk. Thank you. There was a lot of work in this. Um, thank you very much. And um, also the audience for the questions. Um, we should not drag it out in the recording for too long, but we have time, some time for some questions right now. And then maybe if Derek wants to talk off the record afterwards, we can also, after stopping the recording, talk a little bit more. So this is, uh, yeah, immediate questions now. It looks like Giorgio has a question. You're um, muted. It's, muted. it's possible. It's possibly not an immediate question, so I'll I'll ask. Go it for later. it. Go yeah. for it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Can you look at the? Can you show the lattice slide in the beginning? Just the uh, the car. Yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah. I mean, to me, when you said the LHC, to me what is sort of saying here is that the susceptibility which determines fluctuations has this peak, which kind of looks like an O4 peak, like you say. And what your model says is that fluctuations are big enough for these chiral waves to sort of propagate. And we, one has to take this into account. Is this it? Basically that this, that, Basically that you, this, that you can use hydro can to describe hydro. how chiral waves develop, um, right? So you would start above TC. You can use these hydrodynamic equations if this fluctuations are enough, okay? Which is a big if because the mass is really finite. Um, if those chiral, if, if you were close enough, say you were, if you were here, right? I think it would stick, hit you in the head, honestly. honestly. Be, because yeah, the question, yeah. The then you would, start above TC. Yeah. you would start above TC, you do this simulation, basically like CMB seeds well above TC. And then basically as you start expanding, you know, sort of it, these waves develop and you calculate basically like the CMB, somehow the predictions for those soft yields, right? You see the idea. The, the, my question, the question I want to ask is that if you look at the lattice again, for the heat capacity, it will also have a peak of a similar size, right? It's or not. I, I, heat capacity is is a little bit weird. That would be common sound. The equivalent of this would be fluctuations in energy and momentum, which uh, yeah, common so, yeah. So the O4 <laughs> critical point has negative heat capacity. So, uh, I mean, the, the, sorry, not negative heat capacity, positive heat capacity, but the critical exponent is not positive, but negative. And so it actually doesn't diverge, but actually has a cusp. Oh, it has a dip. Yeah, it has a cusp. And so, because it has negative, and, and also I want to say that that critical exponent is much smaller. It's 0.1. Okay, okay. So, it probably is with all of it. Okay, fair enough. Thanks. Pablo, go ahead. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Derek, for. Uh, for, the, for this great talk. If so, on the subject of critical dynamics, if it is what I think it is, it's really fascinating. <laughs> uh, so when I when I think about uh, <coughs> about uh, the simulations that you described, you know, I I naively would imagine um, uh, calculations of of these correlations. Um, uh, are dominated by UV physics in this uh, in this uh, uh, field theory, uh, effective field theory. 
uh, and extracting infrared physics, which is contam contaminated by this, you know, UV noise will be somewhat um, difficult. Um, but then you're saying you just somehow look at how the peak shifts and you extract this uh, that's dynamic. That's true. Dynamic no, exponent. but that's true. That's true, except at the critical point, right? So at the critical point, the UV physics is way longer than the cutoff scale. I mean, you know, the, I, the, the correlation length is way longer than, you know, is dominated by the IR, right? Um, in the sense that there is a cutoff scale, which is much larger than much shorter distance than the correlation line, right? And the core, so right at the critical point, you can use classical dynamics, right? About but the critical dynamics is not classical, right? Oh, it is. It's completely classical. Why, why, why is it? It's always like that, especially the dimensionally reduced theory. Um, this theory is dimensionally reduced. There is no torus, right? Um, you know, but I mean, the, this 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 theory that you have, you know, it's not classical. Like it is the, the critical experts are, are not mean field, right? They're not mean field, uh, but they're still classic. Okay. I mean, the dynamics is classical. Right. So the normal liquid gas. Well, well, well when, when I think classical, I think uh, partial differential equations rather than path integral. Well, it's stochastic. Uh, stochastic equations of motion are path mm -hmm. integrals, right? Yes, 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 yes. And so it's not um, it's not like normal hydro PDEs that give you these critical exponents, right? It's it's more it's it's classical in the sense it's not quantum, but it's, it's, it's far. There's no H bar. The, H the, bar. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. There is no H bar, but it's not classical in the sense that it's without a path integral. No, it's classical statistical. Let's say, let's say it's right, 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 statistical. right, 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 right. And so, um, I guess my question is like, like, how does it work in practical simulation? Does this update algorithm like magically allows you to like get rid of the UV contamination in your observables or? I mean, you basically tune. So you have your equations of motion, okay? If you are far from the critical point, basically you'll find that the correlation length is, is of order the lattice spacing, right? Mm -hmm. And now you see we tune this number M0 with four digits so that we're close to the critical point, right? Uh, I don't know where I put it. Oh, I didn't write it. Anyway, uh, you know, I don't have it here. I don't think, okay. You know, we are, our entire simulation changes this from M0 of 4.81 minus 4.81 to 4 point minus 4.82 you know you know basically you know the entire range of our simulation is just you know from high temperature to low temperature is just dialing this number by some tiny little bits right from above mm -hmm. tc to below tc so and in that very narrow range the correlation length is much longer than the lattice spacing but still with enough effort short compared to the box size, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's in that very narrow range that we are insensitive then to precisely what was the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the lattice spacing, right? Because somehow the correlation length is large compared to the lattice spacing, but short compared to the length. Right, right, I understand that it works for statics, but I guess what you are saying is that it also works for dynamics. It's supposed to work for dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's the lore. Now, I, the way these equations of motion are derived are from this Poisson brackets methods, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it would be lovely for someone to sort of like update that a little bit, you know, uh, sort of rethink the derivation of those equations mm -hmm. of motion um, using the technology of, you know, like what you're doing with this schwinger Keldish hydro, right? And yep. to reformulate that, you know, a little more, uh, formalize those equations of motion a little better, I think it would be worth it. Especially, yeah, right? I think it would be worth it. To read I agree. Like right? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay. Thank you again for.
very nice and informative talk and thanks everyone in the audience um, for the good questions and the great discussion. Um, we conclude this this week's uh, meeting with this and the recording, but um, stick around if you're interested uh, to chat a little longer and otherwise I'll see you next week. Thank you again. <laughs>